I'm going to talk to you a little bit about money, but not in the normal way. I'll just say, uh, disclose right off the bat, I have very little training in economics. I never went to business school. I have trouble balancing my checkbook. I get screwed up with my credit cards. I, um, I don't like balance sheets. Um, so why would I be talking to you about money? My teachers uh, about this topic called money have been people that I used to call poor. And I like to start this way because it's really, I want to honor uh, where the wisdom that I have been given, not that I have, but I've been given, came from about this topic of money and our relationship with money. And um, when I say people I used to call poor, I'm talking about people living in really desperate circumstances in sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in Bangladesh, in um, uh, Ethiopia after the famine, in 1984, 1985, where I received some really profound lessons. Uh, in Mozambique, after the brutal war, in Liberia, after that war, in, in uh, Bangladesh, after a flood. And these people, which I used to call poor and society calls poor, are some of the most resilient, intelligent, courageous, creative people I've ever known. And to call them poor demeans them and those of us who would label that, them that way because they exhibit more courage to live through a day than you and I will probably need in our lifetime. And what's poor is not them. It collapses their circumstances with who they are. Who they are is whole and complete, remarkable people living in the brutal circumstances of poverty. What's poor is their circumstances, not them. And when we collapse those two things, we begin the unfortunate mischief we put around economic circumstances and people and money. I've also learned tremendous lessons from people I used to call rich, um, and I'm a fundraiser for all the things that, uh, that she said about my history. Uh, all of that took money. I've raised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. I love asking people for money. I have to resist myself from not asking you right now. Um, uh, I love asking for money because I know that what I've seen what money can do, small, large, any amount of money, when it's put to good use in this world, when it's moved towards the common good. And as a fundraiser, I w was always looking for and continue to look for people that I used to call rich. <clears throat> and I've learned tremendous lessons from the people I used to call rich, as well as the people I used to call poor. But I don't use that title any longer with people because that also collapses circumstances of excess resources with people who are whole and complete, who have hurts and wounds, who have dreams and wishes, uh, and happen to be living in, and often sometimes created and didn't sometimes create, uh, the, a flood of financial resources that can be the source of great pleasure. Yes, we all kind of want that, but it also can be the source of great agony and great amplification of whatever problems they had that they thought that money would cure. And so some of our wealthiest families have been the um, uh, wonderful colleagues that I've had as a fundraiser and as someone who works with people of wealth to find their center when they have oceans of money or resources to work with, it's way beyond their needs. And they've been incredible teachers for me too. And then um, in these last few years, last couple decades, I worked for decades on ending world hunger with the Hunger Project, which took me to all of the countries where people live in very, very difficult circumstances, to work up close and personal with my hands in the dirt, with people in uh, really brutal financial and physical circumstances uh, and learning from them about what they value and what money means to them when they get their hands on it uh, has been an incredible teaching for me. Uh, and then people of great wealth. But now, in these last few years, I've been working with indigenous peoples of the Amazon who didn't even know there was a thing called money. 
they say, you can't hunt for it, you can't eat it, why would you want it? And to them, it's just mysterious that the people outside of the Amazon uh, want to get in there and do terrible things to their treasured lands and cultures, all for the purpose of this thing called money. And it's totally confusing to them. And to educate them and um, give them uh, access to how to understand or give them some understanding of the modern world, uh, which they now have to have an encounter with in order to survive, has also taught me a great deal of uh, taught me a great deal about money because I had to explain it to them from you know ground zero. So my teachers, my educators about money, have been people like that, uh, and also Mother Teresa, who was an awesome fundraiser. I know you don't think of her like that, do you? <laughs> but she was incredible. And I, I always like to say, if Mother Teresa asked you for money, you would not say no. And she knew that. <laughs> so she was incredible. But when I say that, I, wanna, uh, I, I just want to reference uh, one short story that uh, often uh, is where I got some of my pro most profound lessons about money. And that's from women in Ethiopia after the 1984-1985 famine. And I was uh, in the Rift Valley where a million people died of starvation, most of them children uh, and older people. And I was sitting uh, around a dry well in, in the Rift Valley in Ifat Tanuga, if you know Ethiopia, uh, with uh, seven women who had had many, many, many children. One of them had 11 children. Uh, the one who had the fewest children, the youngest woman, had only had five, which is not that many in that culture. Uh, and they had become childless mothers because every single one of their children had starved to death in the famine. Uh, almost all of them in their arms. And how many of you have children? Can you raise your hand if you have children? So I know it's unimaginable, to, to lose one of your children anyway, but to imagine not being able to feed them, if you're a mother in particular, having them die in your arms. And in this setting around the dry well, we had the opportunity, I had the great privilege, of participating in the ritual of honoring the death of each one of the children that had died in the famine. So each mother would share about the excruciating death of each one of the children, starting with the oldest, how that one died. Little Mohammed, age seven, walking towards the mirage that he thought was water, dropping down, collapsing about 100 feet from the mother who made it over to pick him up, and when she got there, he was dead. Or Malika, who was suckling at her breast, and given that the mother had had no water in seven days, had no milk, and the baby finally stopped sucking and was dead. And after the story of each child, we would wail, we would cry, we would scream, we would uh, embrace, we would um, curl up in balls on the, on the ground uh, until we had completed the initial grieving of that child, and then we would talk about the next child and the next child, and the next child, if you can imagine this. We went all the way around the circle. It took five days and five nights to complete this ritual. When it was over, of course, we were emotionally completely exhausted. And then there was the next day, and that was the day that each woman made a commitment to the other women and to me of how they would use the rest of their life to ensure that no woman went through that trauma again in Ethiopia in any way they could stop that kind of thing from happening again. Now, you would uh, just be so inspired if you had been there to see that commitment. Right after that, I had uh, a meeting in New York City with a group of women in an investment club. These women were wives of the super uber duper wealthy Wall Street merger acquisition kind of guys. Uh, and they were learning about investments. They wanted to dabble in investing since they had married into or uh, received the opportunity to have access to lots and lots of money. And they'd read uh, the book, The Soul of Money, so uh, they asked me to come speak with them. 
And uh, when I got there, I, I couldn't talk about anything but the women in Ethiopia. It was just the only thing that w I, couldn't, I couldn't talk about anything else. And then I realized there's seven women here, sitting in New York in this gorgeous Fifth Avenue apartment, seven women back in Ethiopia. And through the cathartic power of story, they became uh, bonded almost across these oceans that separated these women, oceans, economic oceans and geographic oceans, with each one of the seven women I told them about. And we began a collaboration that changed not only my life, uh, but the lives of actually uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and obviously the 14 women who bonded with each other. Um, and the exchange was a co-equal partnership. It was not the haves giving to the have-nots. It was haves, not H-A-L-V-S, but haves, people who have skills, talent, capacity. These women in Ethiopia know how to read the, uh, the, how, when their cattle need water by looking at the color of their fur. They know how to dry farm. They know how to make seeds go faster. They know how to work and live in a corrupt system. Uh, they have all kinds of incredible talents. Their strength, their resilience, their creativity, their courage, unmatched. Lots of, lots of assets here. And over here, tremendous financial assets, access to senators and congressmen and people of power. So assets meeting assets, not haves meeting have-nots, but a co-equal partnership that created miraculous outcomes for all 14. These women were impoverished, the way Mother Teresa used to talk about the West, impoverished in the soul. All they could do was purchase stuff, get more and more and more clothing and access to beauty and, uh, and status, but it was empty, it was hollow, and they were hurting inside. These women were, um, I would say, spiritually actually very, very profound, very much in touch with who they are, but materially very impoverished. And putting these two together created miracles for everyone, a complete transformation. And these are the teachings I've learned about money. I know it doesn't sound like what you were maybe going to hear. But I'll, I'll say something about the women in Ethiopia because it really, really is important for you to know that I've, uh, I have some knowledge of what happened to those seven women, uh, not all of them, but I know about four of them. And just to say they had had no schooling, they didn't know how to read or write, uh, and after that meeting and after their declaration, uh, they all went to school from what we would call kindergarten all the way through high school. Four of them... Uh, went to graduate school. Three of them got PhDs, PhDs, and one of them became a lawyer. She runs the top women's law firm in Ethiopia. The other three became um, ministers in the government, and one of them is a scientist and runs an environmental institution. Uh, I tell you that story to uh, tell you the power not only of money, but our relationship with money when we realize that when we discover this exquisite distinction of enough, enough, which has no real standing in a consumer culture. The consumer culture, the money culture, is all about more, 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 more more of anything, more of everything. It's a mindset, a constant mindset of scarcity, even for the very, very uber wealthy. It doesn't make any sense at all for people who have billions of dollars to think that they need more, but they do. Not because it's logical, but because the mindset of the culture of money in which we live is a mindset of scarcity. It's a deliberate mindset of scarcity, not your mindset, not my mindset, but the mindset that we swim in that has us behaving in ways that are inconsistent with our humanity and accumulating and acquiring way, 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 way more than we need. We race right past enough as if it isn't even there towards more, and we don't even know that it happened. And so we live in a culture 
that is completely and totally obsessed with more, or I would call the mindset of scarcity. And in the work that I've done, like I described with the Ethiopian women, like the work we do in the rainforest with the indigenous peoples of the Amazon, I have, uh, and through the great teachings of Buckminster Fuller, who I had the great privilege of, of studying with, I have discovered that the radical, surprising truth about life, about money and life, is sufficiency. Sufficiency. That that's the radical, surprising truth. If you clear away the mindset of scarcity and recognize it's an unconscious, unexamined mindset, and it's not real, and we bought into it because we swim in that mindset, but it's not ours. If you can realize it's not yours, you can find waiting for you underneath that is the radical, surprising truth of enough. You are enough. I am enough. Those remarkable young people are enough just exactly the way they are. And when we recognize enough, then when we have more than enough, we realize that's for everybody else. And that overflowing excess, or what I will call natural abundance, is only really available to us, really true prosperity, when we recognize the exquisite distinction of enough that we're met by the universe with exactly what we need. And when we receive by the grace of our productivity, by the grace of our culture, by the grace of being born in the right place at the right time, more than we need, which is probably true of every single person in the room when you really tell the truth, that actually is for others. So I'm going to leave you with um, a metaphor from Brother David Stendhal Rost, the distinction of sufficiency and true abundance, which I don't think you can reach abundance through the doorway of more. I think the doorway of more will always lead you to lack. Always lead you to lack. And then you'll need more. The only true portal to true abundance, rather than excess, true abundance, is through the portal of enough, through sufficiency. The principle of sufficiency is this. If you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, which is what we're brainwashed to want more of. It frees up oceans of energy that's all tied up in that chase to turn and pay attention to what you already have. When you pay attention to what you already have, when you nourish it, when you have it make a difference, and when you share it, it expands. Let me say that again. When you let go of trying to get more of what you don't really need, it frees up all that energy to turn and make a difference with what you have. When you make a difference with what you have, when you share it, it expands. And a final word, what you appreciate, appreciates. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about money, but not in the normal way. I'll just say, uh, disclose right off the bat, I have very little training in economics. I never went to business school. I have trouble balancing my checkbook. I get screwed up. Uh, where the wisdom that I have been given, not that I have, but I've been given, came from about this topic of money and our relationship with money. And um, when I say people I used to call poor, I'm talking about people living in really desperate circumstances in sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in Bangladesh, in um, uh, Ethiopia after the famine in 1984, 1985, where I received some really profound lessons, uh, in Mozambique after the brutal war, in Liberia after that war, in in uh, Bangladesh after a flood. And these people, which I used to call poor and society calls poor, I with my credit cards, I, um, I don't like balance sheets. Um, so why would I be talking to you about money? 
my teachers uh, about this topic called money have been people that I used to call poor. And I like to start this way because it's really, I'm going to honor, are some of the most resilient, intelligent, courageous, creative people I've ever known. And to call them poor demeans them and those of us who would label that, them that way because they exhibit more courage to live through a day, 